Welcome to the Psychological Society of Ireland, the PSI podcast, where we bring you interesting and hopefully entertaining and informative podcasts about a myriad of topics. This time, we're talking about stress and emotional intelligence. Our expert guest this time is uh, Dr. Eva Doherty from the Psychological Society of Ireland. Uh, Dr. Eva, you're very welcome along. Thank you very much. Let's start at the beginning with the emotional intelligence. And what exactly is emotional intelligence? Okay, so the best uh, understood way of of, uh, defining this is that, if you like, it's got four pieces to it. So it's the ability to perceive emotions. So first of all, you need to know that you're actually experiencing emotion in the first place. Um, It's the ability then to use... um, that your your emotional experience to facilitate your thought processes. It's the ability to understand them and to know what they mean. And then it's the ability to manage them so that you can achieve what you want. Is there a test for emotional intelligence? There's a couple of different tests. It's it's quite a new area in psychology. Mm. So it's said to be uh, one of the most controversial areas within uh, psychological science. So there's different ways of testing it and different ways of understanding it. And there's a good bit of kind of uh, controversy. Uh, so there are, yeah, there's two main ways of measuring it. You can either ask people to self-report and to say, you know, what how they think they, they are and how they do. And then you can actually set people um, actual tasks and see how they perform and get and assess it that way. Is it not just another way of describing interpersonal skills? So interpersonal skills, it often is confused with, it, with um, interpersonal skills. Interpersonal skills would be the result you know, would yeah. be the consequence. So if somebody is, um, you know, pretty emotionally intelligent, um, they will be very uh, expert in terms of their interpersonal skills. And a funny thing about that, that can be good or bad. You know, there's a kind of a Machiavellian side of emotional intelligence. It's not just only um, about being a nicey, nicey person. There are maybe some individuals we can think of in the world who are quite Machiavellian in the way they go about things and they have very high EQ and they use that to their advantage. So the, I think the easiest way to understand one's emotions is to think of them like instincts. So they are incredibly adaptive. They they warn us, the organism, if you like, human beings, about potential threats mm. to us. Um, again, a lot of controversy here, but, but the kind of most simplest um, model for understanding it is that we have a number of very simple, basic emotions. And... Often when I ask people the question, do you think emotions are simple or complicated? They always tell me they're complicated. And I think that's because they can lead to complications uh, because people really don't understand them. But there are, if anybody's seen the movie Inside Out, that's a portrayal of five of the basic emotions. And so there are different emotions with different meanings, which tell us about how we are interpreting the world around us and potentially is there a threat. And, you know, most of the emotions make us feel uncomfortable. There's only one totally nice, pleasant one that's happiness. Mm -hmm. Um, And then there's another one that can be half comfortable, half not. Um, And I can tell you about them, which, which, you know, what ones they are, but most of them make us feel uncomfortable. With the instinct thing, your instincts can be wrong. Yeah. So, yeah, so like there's a huge amount written about this and um, Malcolm Gladwell, for example, writes about this all the time. And yeah, your instincts can be wrong if they are coming from false image, false messaging, false information. Mm. So if we interpret things incorrectly or irrationally, we will have an emotional response, which, if you like, is wrong, in inverted commas. However, from the perspective of where the emotion is emanating, it's right. So in other words, like a simple example, you know, if 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 say, I don't know, we're having a phone conversation and, and we think we're not getting a great reaction on the other end of the phone and we go off and we think, oh, that person's really annoyed me now yeah. and they're very critical. They think I don't know what I'm talking about. So we're going to get very uncomfortable feelings in response to that. However, the problem is, is that it's not really our emotions that are wrong. It's our thought processes that may be irrational. Emotional intelligence has gotten bigger as far as big companies are concerned and they're now testing people for it. How is it useful in in, in work to know what kind of emotional intelligence somebody has? So at the very basic level, it is the currency of how we relate to each other. Mm. So so I'm sure everyone listening will have had the experience of trying to make contact with someone who just isn't gelling with them. And there isn't that sort of connection versus somebody that you gel with immediately and get on really, really well Mm. with them. And your emotions kind of link 
link in with with them. Um, so it's very important for those kind of um, interpersonal skills. And so, for example, companies that will, you know, depend a lot on on their sales people will want people who are, you know, high in their EQ and yeah. who are very good at making connections. It's also really important for decision making. So people like to think that they can make decisions and not be emotional. We know that's not true. For the last 10 years, we've had a lot of evidence now to show that when you look at the brains of people under um, in scanning machines and you look at the brains and look at their which part of the brain is active when people are making decisions, you will see the emotional centres being very active. So at the end of the day, it's our emotional emotions that inform us on on the right decision. So um, that's very critical because we want people to be very self-aware when they're making decisions and not making decisions based on, you know, different emotional responses, uh, if you like. So there's so that's a principle. Uh, they're the two. I would think they're probably the two main um, uh, reasons, if you like, why employers are interested. Were people not doing this already? For example, we work in communications. When we are taking somebody on here or, or in other uh, businesses that I've, I've been involved in, you're looking for somebody that will they do the job? Can they do the job? And will they fit in? Yeah. Is it, it, this is the will they fit in? piece as well as can they do the job. It's also can they do the job because you want somebody who's able to self-regulate. You want someone who, you know, wakes up in the morning, maybe feels, you know, negative, has a negative feeling. Maybe they're they're irritable, they're depressed, whatever it is. You want somebody to be able to regulate that in themselves and go, nope, here I go. I'm putting myself in the right mood so that I can go to work, do my job. Um, etc. You don't want somebody who gets completely overwhelmed yeah. and is kind of like, oh, I can't cope t- with today. So, you know, that's another reason, if you like, why emotional intelligence is important. And is it going to show up more in these tests rather than having somebody who, who is, a, I suppose, a good interviewer and will just pick up on it naturally? Yeah. Well, I use, I actually use the performance one mm. as a guide. Now, it's not definitive and, and one should never choose somebody based on, uh, you yeah. know, an EQ um, result alone. But I find it very informative and also I will compare uh, the performance test with how the person has self-reported. So it's very interesting sometimes to see how somebody is coming out on one test and how they report themselves mm. on another. And then you get you get a sense of their insight. You know, some people might report themselves as being super duper in terms of managing stress uh, and yet... Um, the performance measure might not back that up. So that's important information. Do do you find in general that people have a higher opinion of themselves than the test is showing? Uh, funny enough, um, I find that their, their self-image, in all the work that I've done, their self-image is usually accurate enough. If anything, people are more inclined to um, minimise their skills. Right. And, and it goes against... Um, our, our in, intuition really we might think that when people are going for a job they'd be inclined to elevate themselves mm-hmm. I, don't, I find that doesn't happen uh, and that would be written up in the literature as well that actually when you use these measures people don't tend to infl- overinflate. Is that worldwide or is it just Ireland? The reason I think I'm asking is because you find in the culture here you say to somebody how are you and they say oh, I'm grand whereas you say to say it to an American how are you I'm really good you know so <laughs> Yeah. Um, no, that's that's American literature. In fact, it, I don't even know of any Irish study that's right. been done. Um, well, sorry, I've done some research on it and have found the same thing. I haven't published it yet, but um, but the, all the published literature, actually most of it would be American. Right. Yeah. How does emotional intelligence then tie in with stress? OK, so when we're stressed, it has to do with our emotions. Mm. Um, and it, and this brings us to the, you know, the actual types of emotions because they tell us, you know, very much what's going on and what's threatening us. So let's say the most common one uh, that we would connect in with stress is fear. Mm. So fear tells us that we're anticipating the future in some way. So we're, we're thinking that there's something about to happen. It could be in five minutes time, two hours time, a month's time. We don't want it to happen. We're anticipating that it will. And so that triggers the stress response, you know, in in ourselves to protect ourselves. Or we might be getting very stressed because we're we're very irritable. That's a different emotion. So that's anger. Mm -hmm. That one will inform us, wait a minute, this has got something to do with something I need, something I want, something that's important to me. And it's being blocked from me in some way. Now, if we think of our needs, our human needs have been arranged in a hierarchy. People might be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy. And so we have very basic needs 
for food and shelter and a roof over our heads. And then those needs become more sophisticated, if you like. We have needs for for relationships, affiliation needs. but And then we have even more sophisticated needs, needs for recognition. Um, and so it might be that we're in a job maybe where we're not getting recognition and, that, and we're angry about that. Or it could be that we're in a job where it's really hard to have a lunch break or a cup of coffee. You know, there's no proportion here. You can feel just as angry and frustrated because, you know, you can't get a cup of coffee as you can because you're not being recognised, funny enough. Do people always recognise that they're stressed? No. Um, this is where the high EQ comes mm. and the and the level of self-awareness. So somebody, let's say, who, who maybe has a limited ability or limited... Uh, awareness or even vocabulary ma- will be experiencing stress so they'll have maybe some idea that things are not right but I mean I think a lot of people again maybe listening to this podcast will have the experience of others saying to them you know would you ever calm down and you kind of gives you a little bit of a kind of a second kind of thing and you go what there's nothing wrong with yeah. me and, and then you kind of go okay actually maybe I am a little bit stressed out here and so awareness can differ. Do you have any particular strategies to uh, to manage stress? So what I do with people when I'm working with them is, first of all, to give them words for these emotions and um, help them to start recognising them, help them to um, realise which emotion means the different meaning, help them to respect their emotions, that they're very, very important. Like this, this is important data. This is not touchy feely soft yeah. skills. This is really important stuff going on. And then to, you know, I, sometimes I have to get people to write down what's happening because they need to figure out what's the difference between a thought and a feeling. And they need to figure out that they're not the same. And yet we talk about them quite interchangeably. So people will say, well, you know, I really feel that he shouldn't have said what he said. That's not a feeling. That's a thought. Mm. But we put I feel in front of it mostly because we don't want to be challenged. You know, we want to hang on to that thought. So I'll teach people how to challenge their thoughts and how to say, well, now, do I really have evidence for that? You know, is that a, is that a, an interpretation that I'm making about something which is feeding into my emotions? So that's one way. Um, there's lots of other ways you can manage stress as well. I can tell you a bit about that too. Please do. I mean, I think different styles um, will help different people. Mm. So some people really love that cognitive approach is what it's called. And there's about, there's, you know, 50 years plus now evidence to show that that technique of going about things is actually more effective in the long term than um, antidepressant medication, especially in from the point of view that when people stop, especially if they're mildly or moderately moderately depressed and they go on antidepressant medication and then they stop they tend to have a relapse whereas if you've learned the cognitive technique it, it lasts you longer but there's other ways of going about it I mean pe- some people might like to tackle it purely from a physiological perspective it's like one of the easiest things we can do when we're stressed is breathe because one of the first things that stops um, being easy is our breathing when we get stressed because if you like historically we had to get ready to run away from mm-hmm. dinosaurs so we stop we stop breathing properly and lots of physiological uh, consequences flow from that so that's essentially what mindfulness is about Sent- uh, you know mindfulness is about breathing properly in for seven out for eleven in through your nose out through your mouth and then focusing on your breathing and just being in the now is a really effective, really easy thing to do. Some people might like to uh, learn how to, you know, control their actual muscle responses. So that would be what we would call relaxation training. Mm. And essentially what you're doing is you're 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 dealing with the sort of consequences of what's gone on in the brain. You know, the body is now in a state of readiness and that in itself is causing a problem. So through breathing, through relaxation, you know, you're accessing it that way. There are other people for whom, you know, those techniques may not suit exactly and they might manage their stress other ways. They might manage their stress through their relationships with others. Supportive relationships are really, really important. They might manage their stress through, you know, their 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 sleeping regimes. Mm. You know, we know the huge amount of research coming out now about the importance of sleep um, for lots of things. Um, another one is diet Uh, In other words, great research coming out from Cork now about how our diet um, has a direct effect on our mental health through our vagus nerve right to our brain. So we have we have a profile, a fingerprint, if you like, of bacteria in our gut that directly influences our mental health. So diet is critical. 
Um, and then, you know, exercise can't, you know, emphasise how important that is. And sometimes that fits in better for people. How do you know which strategy you, applies to you or do you go through a process of knocking out the ones that don't work for you? You'll get, again, yeah, I think this is where you do trust your instincts. I think some people will listen to this range of techniques and will go, you know, oh my goodness, relaxation training, forget about it. Mm. I'm never going to do that. But, you know, swimming three or four times a week, I'd actually love that. You know, I, that would really appeal to me. Or, you know, sitting down with friends and socialising and getting support that way. So very extrovert people, you know, will will get mm. will get a lot out of that. Other people will want to actually, you know, have their own time to themselves. So people need to kind of, if you like, research all these different ways and really just get a sense of I like that. I don't like that. You know, do you get a yes feeling or a no feeling? Is there a time then when when they should go and see a psychologist? So what I would say there is if it is that you try all these techniques, you're not making any progress, you feel like I think what I noticed, too, is that lots of people will recognize that their reactions are, if you like, a bit OTT, a bit over the top. Mm. And when that's happening, it may be that their reactions, if you like, have a history and maybe they don't understand what that history is. And, you know, it's a very valid history, very important. And so if they're finding that they are not making progress like they would like to make, that's probably the time to think about going, you know, for help because you need somebody who can be objective, who can spot things, who can feed stuff back to you and say, I'm noticing this, I'm noticing that. What about this? What about that? But that kind of over the top reaction is a real sign that there's there's a there's a history. And, you know, you need to kind of get to know what that history is. It's like it's a bit like a, an iceberg and our mind is mm. an iceberg and you're lowering the level of the water. And they may not necessarily recognize that themselves. Maybe if people are saying to them, you know, God, you're you know, will you relax? And yeah. They think they're fine. As yeah. you were saying earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's a it's a measure of kind of, you know, is this really affecting me? Is it affecting me and others and or others enough to warrant taking the time out to go and get help? Yeah. It's a value judgment at the end of the day. Some people go for it, some people don't. I always um, respect people's own sense. I think nobody should be forced to come to somebody like me. It has to be something that feels right because people will have their own internal filter. They will filter what they are able for. And if people are looking for a psychologist, they can go to psychologicalsociety.ie. Eva Doherty from the uh, Psychological Society of Ireland. I think uh, we've we've learned an awful lot. Thank you so much for your time. That was the Psychological Society of Ireland, the PSI podcast. We'll see you next time. <laughs>